charge. Go Back ahead. In the flip, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Tonight is Tuesday, November 10th, 2020 at 7 p.m. This meeting is being held according to the governor's executive order. Ellen, can we get roll call, please? Yes, Chair Chairman Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present, he says. Thank you. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Here. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Tiago Nguyen? Here. All present. Thank you. Mr. Riley, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the United, United States, States, States of America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, which it stands, stands one nation, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and justice, and justice for all. For all. All right, Mr. Michaels, I believe you have a motion to approve minutes. Yes, let's make a motion to approve the minutes of the October 27th, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Education. Do I have a second? Mr. Cassio, second. thank you. Any comments or questions? Seeing none with a motion to second the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Thank you, Ms. Evans. So noted. Motion passes. Moving on to public comment. I see we have a phone call here, Mr. Emmett. We do, Mr. Carey. If the number ending in 3781 can state your name and address, you have five minutes of public comment. Yes, my name is Todd Helwick and I live at 113 James Earl Road. My Thank comments you. tonight are about um, thank you. Uh, my comments tonight are about what I believe have been an unfortunate series of missed opportunities for the school district this year. And I'm calling in to make these comments tonight, not to try and place blame or to point fingers at anyone in particular, but I'm calling instead in hopes of making the remaining three quarters of this year and potentially next school year, a time that affords students more access to in-person schooling and not less. It would be an understatement to say that I was disappointed in August when I learned that the entire district would begin the year under the hybrid model. I have two elementary age children who I hoped would return to school on a full-time basis, even if the middle and high schools had to operate under a hybrid plan. High school students are old enough and most are independent enough to stay home alone while managing their academic responsibilities. Some eighth grade students may also be capable. However, there are no students in the elementary school with the same capabilities. And I think the one size fit all approach the district took to the reopening of schools has been a missed opportunity for the district's youngest and least independent students. At the end of September, the health metrics that we so rely upon these days justified a reopening of schools. We were notified that the district planned to spend the month of October redefining plans for a full reopen. A full reopening plan had already been developed last July, but for some reason it was determined that an entire month was needed to revise this plan. As you're all well aware, the health metrics declined during October, and as a result, nothing has improved in terms of an increased amount of time for in-person learning. By not having a workable reopening plan ready to go, we missed a big opportunity for a return to school for the month of October. I would urge the district and the board to please continue to revisit the current reopening plan so that once the health metrics improve enough to contemplate reopening, we have a feasible plan ready to go without needing to again spend an entire month in waiting. 
Another example of a missed opportunity, in my opinion, is what is occurring with Emerson Williams Elementary. At the time of the phone call that we received notifying us of the need to close Emerson Williams for two weeks, we thought we understood why. We were told that there weren't enough teachers to adequately staff the building for the next two weeks. The next morning, I was pleased to find out that my children's two teachers were both healthy and therefore not in need of self-quarantining at home. But I was also very surprised to see them teaching from their empty classrooms at a school that was shut down. I still can't understand why the entire school needed to move to remote learning when there are teachers who have not needed to self-quarantine and are in fact required to continue to teach from school. To me, a reasonable solution would have been to continue hybrid learning for teachers and cohorts that were able to. This, in my opinion, is another example of a one-size-fits-all approach that has resulted in missed learning opportunities for the district's youngest students. The decision to conduct all classes remotely instead of only the classes taught by teachers needing to self-quarantine has reduced an already inadequate four days of in-person schooling over the next two weeks to zero days for the majority of students. The hybrid model has been challenging enough for working families who cannot work from home. We've struggled at times on a weekly basis to come up with a plan for supervision for our children on remote learning days. And this particular situation has made it even worse. Finally, I would ask the board to please be involved in the decision-making process going forward. Let's work together to have a reasonable and feasible plan at the ready for when the situation improves enough to be able to consider a reopening of schools. I would guess that the members of the board either have children who currently are in or who have already gone through our school system so you know the excellence of Weathersfield Public Schools and the importance of our students learning in a classroom instead of at a kitchen table or in their bedroom. Let's also make sure that we, have the, that we give the same consideration to positive health metrics that we do to negative health metrics. We've used declining health metrics as a reason to limit the amount of in-person learning at our schools. Let's be sure to take advantage of improved health metrics and let's be ready with a plan to use them as a reason to reopen schools as soon as the situation permits. Thank you for your consideration and that concludes my comments. Thank you, can thank you, you for your phone call. Can he repeat his name one more time? I'm sorry. No, he left. Oh, okay. Sorry. No problem. Anyone else in the queue, Michael? No, no one else in the queue, Mr. Carey. All right, seeing no other public comment. Mr. Emmett, communications. Yeah, I have several items uh, for you this evening. Uh, first and foremost, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, obviously, uh, the focus this evening with regard to communications is the, uh, the health metrics and the health mm -hmm. metrics not going in the uh, positive direction at this point in time. So as everyone's aware, we've seen a significant spike in the number of COVID-19 cases over the past two weeks. The district has received notification of at least one positive case each day since Sunday, November 1st. The district's nurse, uh, Supervisor Chloe Bobrowski, is on the meeting this evening, and she and I will be providing you with an update on the current data for the Weathersfield Public Schools. Uh, the increase in the number of positive cases, coupled with contact tracing requiring multiple staff members being quarantined, has significantly taxed our subpool, as our caller um, referenced, and it's resulted in us having to shift some schools to full remote learning during the quarantine period. Um, while we would like to be able to quarantine select grades, um, we have a variety of different staff members that provide support, such as lunch aides, uh, building subs, which are quarantined. Uh, we have unified arts teachers, which um, in some cases are also quarantined. And we also have other extenuating circumstances around transportation, uh, access to lunch. There are a variety of different uh, factors that we have to look at in terms of how we proceed with our model. Let me be clear. I want to see every one of our kids back in school on a full-time basis, five days a week. But I've said from the beginning of time, since we started with this pandemic, we wish to do this as safely as possible in keeping in mind the health and safety of our students and our staff. Um, as you know, we were prepared to begin the month of November with a 
broad reopening for students in pre-K, K and one, one team at the middle school in grade seven, one team at the middle school in grade eight, as well as our uh, seniors in the class of 2021 at the high school. We had consultation with the Central Connecticut Health District and we had metrics that showed that the rate of infection was going up. Over the past two weeks, Weathersfield as a town has gone from the orange level where we had an infection rate of 10.6 per 100,000 cases uh, to the red level most recently last Thursday, which we are currently at 15.6 cases per 100,000. Again, we continue to be in contact with the Central Connecticut Health District. We continue to be involved with uh, weekly meetings with the Department of Public Health. We wanna make sure that we move forward with the reopening plan as soon as it is safe to do so. And again, at this point in time, the expectation is we remain in hybrid and avoid having to go to full remote. But with that, it's gonna take some help. We've seen a lot of spread within the community uh, as my communications have borne out. We've seen uh, spread through sports and we have seen spread through social gatherings. Now is a time where we are seeing a large increase in number of cases. So let me give you an example. Last Friday, I reported to you that the CCHD reported 395 cases in Weathersfield. As of this afternoon, we are currently at 428 cases. So the cases are on the rise. And right now our efforts are to maintain our schools in hybrid mode to do the best possible job of getting kids in the building and not having to go full remote. I will say also with regard to the sub process, um, you were very gracious in supporting me and offering up a total of 23 building sub positions. I can tell you that the most that we have been able to fill over the course of this year are 14 positions. We continue to work to fill long-term sub positions for our staff members who will be going out on maternity leave. We're working on one right now at uh, Hammer. In addition to that, I have uh, finished the interview process and we are awaiting a new permanent teacher joining us at the Webb Elementary School for a grade three vacancy. And that individual will be joining us at the end of the month of November. So there continue to be a lot of moving parts uh, and I think that moving forward, we're going to have to weather this storm collaboratively. Again, with the mitigation strategies, if you're sick, stay home. If you're symptomatic, stay home. That goes for every single one of our staff members. If you are feeling ill, stay home. And again, for parents, we ask you to please keep your children home if they are symptomatic. Chloe will talk a little bit more about the process of contact tracing um, a little bit later on in, uh, in the meeting. But again, mitigation strategies, wearing masks, kids have done a great job with that. Staff overall has done a great job as well, but we've got to make sure we're diligent with that. Hand washing, making sure that we have all of the necessary materials in our schools that are all paramount to making sure that we um, can a couple of other items for you this evening, uh, board members and members of the public. I uh, just want to let you know that the New England Association of Schools and Colleges wrapped up their two-day visit with staff and students of the Weathersfield High School this afternoon as part of the school's accreditation process. This visit was rescheduled from May 4th and May 5th this past spring, and we expect to receive NEASC's report within the next month. Weathersfield High School administration and teacher leaders will share the report with you at an upcoming board meeting once we receive it. And I just want to make sure everyone is aware that the fall sports season is wrapping up their abbreviated season this week. Uh, the Department of Public Health for the state of Connecticut has released uh, new guidelines related to winter sports. Uh, these came out yesterday afternoon. The CIAC still needs to meet in order to define what the winter schedule is going to look like. Um, November 1st was our original date to start training. That has been pushed off at this time. Uh, I expect to have additional information in time for the next board meeting, and I will be asking Athletic Director Mike Maltesi to join us for a wrap up of fall sports and an update on our upcoming winter schedule. And with that, that's communications. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to action items. Mr. Lesser, I believe you have a motion for us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I move that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve an extension to the current unpaid leave of absence for ID number 906520 beyond the previously approved 60 days of unpaid leave granted by the superintendent and the Board of Education. This leave, this leave falls under the provisions of Article 11, Section E of the current agreement between the Weathersfield Board of Education and the CSEA SEIU Local 2001. This request is for extended unpaid leave beginning on November 9th, 2020 and continuing through December 31st, 2020 of the 2020-2021 school year. Thank you. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Any qu comments, Mr. Emmett? Uh, yeah, Mr. Donahue, uh, Donahue, if you could just fill us in on this one. This is an extension of an existing leave, correct? Yes, absolutely. So, so good evening, everyone. Um, so we have a situation where we have an employee who has been out uh, for the first 60 days of the school year. Mr. Emmett did approve an unpaid leave of absence to start the school year, and the board did extend that um, a few meetings ago. This individual um, who is part of the Secretary Para Clara group is still in need of providing support to her young family at home. And so is simply asking for an extension of the leave that she is currently on until she is able to get her home fares in order and is hoping to return after the first of the, uh, the new calendar year. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you, Chuck. Trent, quick question. How are we filling her position right now? So for positions like this, Ken, we are filling them through Kelly uh, substitutes. So it's a short-term fill until we have the employee back at work. And we had no trouble finding someone through Kelly? So um, as Michael has indicated, we've um, had some difficulty over the course of the school year finding subs in general. Um, we've been fortunate enough to find a sub for the time being, um, but that's, not a, that's certainly not a guarantee for the foreseeable future. But we, we do have a substitute in place for the time being. Got it, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, with a motion on the table and a second, all in favor, say aye. 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 Extensions, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to reports and discussion items. Mr. Emmett, COVID-19 update. Yes, thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening again, everyone. Um, we wanted to make sure that we provided uh, the community with an update in terms of what our case numbers look like here in Weathersfield. Um, as I mentioned during communications, we uh, have seen a rather sharp uh, uptick in the number of cases that we've seen in Weathersfield, and it certainly impacted the uh, Weathersfield Public Schools. So like to take this opportunity again to uh, reintroduce uh, our nurse supervisor for the district, Ms. Klo uh, Bobrowski, who'll be providing some uh, data points and talking about contact tracing and mitigation strategies. So without further ado, Ms. Bobrowski. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to your board of ed meeting tonight. I'd like to present to you our current up-to-date Westfield Public Schools COVID-19 trend data. School opened to students on September 1st, and we began receiving reports of positive cases within two weeks. Initially, per the AAA document that we received from uh, the Connecticut State Department of Ed, and the guidance documents from uh, the Department of Public Health, schools were instructed to be prepared to facilitate contact tracing with the local health department by providing contact information to students or staff. Ex to excuse me, just a second. With the understanding that the health department would oh. notify anyone who would need to quarantine as close contacts or isolate as positive cases. Well, that was in theory. But the reality is that the schools are doing the bulk of contact tracing and notifying students and staff with guidance 
from Charles Brown, SCCHD. Do you yes? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you you were you were you frozen. Me? You were frozen and we were struggling you hear to hear you. I can hear you. Maybe she could rejoin. Okay. Let's see if I can get back in. But you can hear me okay? You're really uh, okay. lagging. You're lagging. Hop out and rejoin, please, Claude, if you could. The wonders of technology. <laughs> and you wonder why I hate it. Well, it's another reason why we need to get this pandemic out of the way so we can do these in person again. All right. Chloe coming aboard again. about now? No. Still a little me? laggy. Oh, yeah, I can't I understand anything. My, my internet. Yeah, could I, could I also have oh, no. all the rest of the board members please mute? Do we just have Chloe on? Okay. I guess some, my internet might be, I don't know. Can you hear my voice? I can see here, I can see all of you. Uh, hmm. Chloe, can you do this, please? Can you jump off and can you call me on my cell phone, please? Yeah. You want me to use my phone? Yes. We'll make this happen. Sorry for this. It's all right. It's what our parents deal with every day. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Chloe. Okay. Okay. So should I just start from the beginning? So should I just start? Yeah, no, what you want to do is you want to mute. Let me mute you. Got it, Derek. Try this. Mm. Try again. Okay, how about now? How about now? Can, you, little, can you put your volume down on your computer, please? Okay, go ahead. Let's okay, give it a try. Better. Okay. All right. I apologize. Um, I guess I'll start from the beginning. I want to thank everybody for inviting me to the Board of Ed meeting. Um, I'd like to present to you our current. I can't hear anything either. Michael, we can't hear.
It was working when he was unmuted. All right, go ahead, Chloe. Try it now. Okay. How about now? Is this okay? People can hear? Board members, can you hear? I can hear her now. Okay. okay. All right. All right. I'll hold I'll it up on the computer. I'll talk, I'll talk loud. Um, All right. So. so uh, no, nope, we lost her again, Mike. Mike, should Mike. we do the next meeting? Mike, or you can't us? be muted. Go ahead. Mike, there yep, you go. Got it. Go ahead, Chloe. Okay. So initially per the AAA document that we received from the Department of Ed and the guidance documents from DPH, schools were instructed to be prepared to facilitate contact tracing with our local health department by providing contact information for students or staff to the department with the understanding <clears throat> that the health department would notify anyone who would need to quarantine as close contacts or isolate as positive cases. Well, that was in theory, but the reality is that the schools are doing the bulk of contact tracing and notifying students and staff with the guidance from Charles Brown and CCHD due to the overwhelming numbers of cases that have occurred in our school district and our health district, which includes Berlin, Rocky Hill, Wethersfield, and Newington. I would like to thank all of the administrative staff, principals in all of the schools, our school nurses, and our IT department, especially Mr. Jeff Telke for preparing this presentation tonight so that we are able to um, deliver this important data. Um, we update it on a daily basis and we would like to present this valuable information to you tonight. All right, go ahead, Jeff. As you can see, at this uh, as of today, 1110, we do have 27 positive cases with uh, that include students and staff. Uh, we do have 258 students who are, who are currently in quarantine. Um, this, as you can see, the spike in the recent activity, that's not my stress level, that's the actual number of students who are being quarantined at this time, 258 in this, within the district. We have 53 staff members who are being quarantined currently in the district, in, in the schools. In this slide, you can see the breakdown of the positive cases total. We have 22 student cases. We have five staff cases. Um, just today alone, today's positive cases, I reported to the Department of Public Health four positive student cases and one positive staff case. So that, uh, you know, total number is five. And as of today, we have 258 students in quarantine and 52 uh, staff members in quarantine for a total of 310. This slide also demonstrates where the uh, most people are being quarantined and also the number of uh, total positive cases. So in Hamner right now, it's got uh, less activity, uh, five students in quarantine, one staff member in quarantine. Charles Wright, um, three student cases that are positive, um, or um, one positive uh, staff case. We did have to quarantine a student, um, or students and staff related to the positive staff case. Um, and Emerson Williams, you can see we have a number of students who are in quarantine with, with staff, again, associated with a positive um, uh, student case. Highcrest has recently had an uptick in their um, quarantine and their uh, positive cases, um, resulting in 14 staff being in quarantine and 20 to 27 um, uh, 40, and 45 students being in quarantine. Webb reported its first case today um, and for a student 
Uh, they certainly have um, the low, lower numbers as well, which is which is good. Um, we did have quite the event yesterday at Silas D Middle School where we had to quarantine 96 members of the students population and um, 15 staff members are currently in quarantine. So they really had a number. And then we've included other, we've included WTA, which has a positive student, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the high school, four student positive and one staff member positive. Um, and now I have something that's hiding the rest of my data, but you can see, if you can see that, I've got a little box here I can't seem to get rid of. Um, we also had a bus driver, which we put onto the WTA slide as being reported as a um, staff person um, because they're mainly associated. Um, that is why that we have a positive staff uh, number under WTA because it was actually a bus driver not a teacher or a staff member who work in WTA. But the guidance from DPH is when I report the data to them on a daily basis that we, we have to find a place to be able to report these people who are contracted by the district. And we try to find the most of uh, the places where they're most associated with. So that is why we have a positive staff case with WTA. Um, so we are uh, current you know, we, cur we update this data on a daily basis, and you can see that we have a tremendous amount of activity that's occurring. Um, what I do like to point out to this day, that there has been zero transmission of COVID-19 within our schools. And even though our town is in the red zone with the number of positive cases per 100,000 people, um, per the Connecticut Department of Public Health town level COVID response work. Uh, these numbers, which get updated every two weeks on Thursday, we are currently are at 15.6, as Michael had pointed out earlier. Um, this, rate, this rate also supports um, the Department of Education guidance to remain in a hybrid status model, monitor these trends, and reassess the possibility of a full reopening when we see trends going down. The Department of Education has provided a chart for the Connecticut School Learning Model Indicators. This chart is found on their website and it provides indicators of COVID-19 community spread and is attended, intended to assist school districts with determining the level of in-person education that they will offer. This, this uh, information is updated on a weekly basis is, and is released every Thursday. Right now, with our case positivity rate of 15.6 in Weathersfield, it's within the guidance of reducing a person density in school buildings, which is the hybrid model. And if we reach the red zone of greater than 25 positive cases per 100,000 people, then they would recommend even less in-person uh, learning. So these metrics were adapted from recommendations by the Harvard Global Institute and supplemented by the existing Department of Public Health measures. Again, the summary table suggests that the Hartford County is in the moderate leading risk category and reduce and recommendations to reduce the uh, person density within the buildings. So we are following guidance from the Department of Public Health. We're following guidance from the Department of Education. We anticipated a surge in cases after last weekend on Halloween and we got it. And we've observed gatherings and I wanna reinforce the messages from the Department of Public Health, CCHD, Department of Education and federal officials to urge everyone to think about the, their decisions when coming together either for upcoming holidays and as we move forward and going indoors for the cold weather, we have had a really nice break with having good weather and being able to go outside, letting our kids go outside, being able to social distance, um, we want to continue to um, 
really practice our social distancing. People are social creatures. It's very hard, but we must continue to work and help each other by applying all of the strategies in place. What we are demonstrating is that a hybrid model controls the risk of their transmission within our schools. The mitigating strategies that we have in our schools are working with less students present in president schools, even in our tighter schools. We can promote social distancing. We can require everyone to wear a mask, which is not necessarily what's going, what's happening outside of our buildings. We require frequent hand washing. The ventilation of our buildings is being maintained. The cleaning of our buildings is occurring. We are asking people to stay home if they feel sick. We are isolating immediately anyone who gets sick at school to contain and reduce the risk of transmission. All of these strategies together improve our chances to remain open in the hybrid. What we're seeing is that transmission of COVID-19 is occurring in our community and we are protectors of the school against some of the behaviors that are occurring outside. So again, we just really want to urge everyone to continue as a community to practice the mitigating strat strategies, lowering the numbers of people that you um, are with, um, practice wearing your, wear your masks, wash your hands, do everything so that we don't have to really kind of clean up the messes actually that we have on them during when people come to school. Um, it's, it's, it is very encouraging to note again, no zero transmission of COVID-19 during inside of any of our schools. So going forward with this data, we will be adding a column in, a, in this current tracking tool for the use of isolation rooms in the schools so that we would be able to pinpoint on any given day if there was more use identified in our isolation rooms and if more kids are coming to school with any symptoms, which includes fever, sore throat, cough, shortness of breath, headache, chills, nausea, diarrhea, and loss of taste or smell. So we were really looking for, um, initially we looked at if there were two, at least two of these um, symptoms that we would consider it to be COVID and we would send people, but now we're looking at even one symptom because of the increased um, cases of COVID in our uh, community of Weathersfield. So I hope you found this presentation helpful. I'm sorry that I've had to report, you know, this type of data. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Any board members with questions or comments? Yes, Chuck. Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, most importantly, Chloe, I want to thank you for all you're doing. You probably never imagined or ever had a year anything like this that you're having this year. And, you know, uh, I, I think for the whole community, we owe you a big um, debt of gratitude. Thank you for your hard work. And it is so important this year. Two questions, which I think I know the answer, but just to confirm. Um, okay. the, amount of, the amount of amount of time in quarantine um, is that 10 or 14 days or something else? I think I know the answer. And secondly, is there any opportunity for a staff member or a student to test out, test negative out of quarantine? Okay, so yes, I can answer both of those questions. So the definition of a quarantine is 14 days. And that is, that is applied to anyone who is identified as a contact of a person with with COVID-19. So that person is a contact and they would need to quarantine, stay, stay home, do not come to school, uh, stay away from others and, um, and, and not attend extracurricular events, uh, not play in sports, just really kind of stay home and um, monitor for symptoms. And a person who has been identified with a positive case of, of, of COVID-19 
isolates for 10 days. So they monitor their symptoms. And again, they stay home and isolate from uh, their family. If they're living with family members, isolate from family members, which is very difficult to do. But if they have their own bedroom, their own bathroom, sometimes their own kitchenette, not share common utensils, wipe down surfaces such as carrot machines, those kinds of things, those people isolate um, in order to, um, you know, and then they can re actually return back to school if their symptoms have improved, they're completely well, and of course they haven't had a fever for 24 hours. So those are two different definitions. Quarantining and isolating are different. Um, and to your question regarding can a person test out of quarantine, the answer is no. Even though we have a travel advisory which allows people to uh, test out of a quarantine, it is because they, uh, do not have a known exposure to a positive COVID case. When we isolate people or when we ask people to quarantine, it's because they have been identified as a close contact to a person who, ha who has um, COVID-19. So they have to stay home and quarantine for 14 days because our research and science has shown that the period of 14 days allows for the full incubation period for the development of symptoms. And it can occur as we speak with our officials from the Department of Public Health and our local health official, uh, Charles Brown, that it may take up to that 13th and a half day before people may develop symptoms. So that is why they cannot test out of um, quarantining uh, if they've been identified as a close contact to a known COVID-19. Got it. Thank you. And again, thank you for all you're doing. Well, you're quite welcome. Any other questions, board members? Chloe, I, I just had one question uh, just for clarification purposes. Um, recently, uh, we had talked with Charles about the CDC guidelines around um, that 15 minutes piece, and the CDC just recently changed that guidance. Can you explain uh, what that change was and how it's impacted how we contact trace? Yes. And originally, the CDC guidelines definition of a close contact was uh, being within six feet uh, for 15 minutes or more continuously, a whole block of time. Uh, those guidelines have since changed due to studies. Uh, I believe it was a... Um, a prison um, guard was developed uh, developed COVID-19. He never spent any time, no, any more than a few minutes with people within um, that prison. But it was the cumulative time that indicated that even though he didn't send, spend a whole chunk of 15 minutes with anyone, the time kind of built up. So now it is a cumulative 15 minutes of time over a 24-hour period. So we have adapted that, those revised guidelines, and we've included them into all of our documents and our framework. So Chloe, how would you define close contact now? Six feet and a cumulative of 15 minutes? Yes. And ma mask is not withstanding. Doesn't make a difference yes. if you're, even if you're wearing a mask, we still have to look at that. If you're within six feet for that cumulative 15 minutes, we have to consider you as a close contact. So that clearly has increased the number of quarantines that we have to do. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for all you do, Chloe. Thank you for joining us Welcome. tonight. All right, moving on. Thank you, Chloe. Okay. Board members, Check your packets for announcements and information. Meetings held. We had the WEC, the Wellesley Early Childhood Collaborative Meeting on 11 9 20. Ms. Granado. Uh, um, they canceled their meeting on Monday and they will not be meeting again till January 9th, 2021. Okay, so that's the, the minutes of that meeting. Great. Thank you. Meeting scheduled Students, Programs, and Services Committee next Tuesday, 6 30 p.m. 
Crack Council next Wednesday, 11, 18, 20 at 11.30 a.m. And Finance and Operations Committee, 11, 24, 20 at 6 p.m. We have no unfinished business, public comment. Mr. Emmett, anyone on the phone for public comment? I see no one on the phone at this time, Mr. Carey. Thank you. Moving on to board comment. Board members wishing to make comment. Chuck, I'd like to say something. Yes, Mr. Cassio, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, it's going to be an exhausting uh, fall, but hopefully we can all work together and make it through the winter season. Um, secondly, I'd just like to give a shout out to the Safe Grads uh, party uh, planners. Uh, Amy Zagaya uh, is out there flocking individuals or committees working very hard to keep the spirit going for the class of 2021. So if you haven't been flocked and you want to be, let me know and I'll submit your name. But there shows you there's still some, a lot of school spirit and the parents are really working hard uh, to continue somewhat of a framework for these kids. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cassio. Anyone else? Mr. Michaels. Bobby had her hand up first though. All right, Ms. Granado. Okay, well, first of all, John, I was flocked. I was so excited when I went out and saw those gorgeous flamingo birds. Um, I just wanted to comment on the um, Keen for Kids Coalition meeting. They did meet on October 29th, a virtual meeting. Caroline Fasino, who works for the school system, no, she doesn't work for the school system, she works the Keene Foundation in the school system, reported that a virtual after school summer big time science program did well with about 18 kids signed up. They are going to send out through the school district and park and rec um, notices, emails to parents to try to get more kids involved in that next session. What's happening is that because of COVID, um, they really don't have the time to put in the after school program because of the, the way the schedule is working. And the Keene Foundation is also working on fundraising for next year, not this year, which is another added impediment to them doing our after school program. But they're still working. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granado. Mr. Michaels. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Emmett, just a quick question. I know it seems like we're beating a dead horse, but um, can you share maybe a timeline as to what we sh when we would expect a December schedule for? Yes, yeah, maybe absolutely. Like November? Yeah, absolutely. At this point in time, we're working uh, on two fronts. We're looking at it from a perspective of uh, a broader reopening. We're also looking at a perspective of continuing in the hybrid model. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and as Chloe mentioned as well, our numbers unfortunately continue to go up and are moving us more toward maintaining the hybrid model or potentially even having to go remote. Um, I'd certainly like to see the uh, rate, that 14 day average go down below 10, which puts us back into the yellow. Uh, range. That's where we started when we went to embark upon our broader reopening. Uh, and unfortunately, as I said, we've gone in the opposite direction. So we are preparing a uh, calendar for uh, hybrid for December. And we're also looking at moving forward with the reopening plan. As you know, uh, it was our intention to get the uh, young kids in first and foremost. I will be the first to tell you as we assess that reopening, uh, looking at the secondary level, our caller talked about that earlier. Uh, the secondary level from what we've seen is much more difficult to cohort. Um, and if I were looking at this again, following Thanksgiving vacation, I'd focus pre-K, K and one first and foremost. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot of is, well, all the other districts have fully reopened. Uh, most have not with regard to secondary. Um, and I know that we had a rather robust plan where we were gonna at least get our seniors in to make sure we didn't lose anybody through the cracks. But looking at the numbers, looking at the difficulty we had at Silas Dean this week in terms of trying to figure out where the cohorts were, um, the secondary would be a lot more difficult uh, to move forward with. But again, I remain committed to getting our younger learners in first and foremost. 
Um, Chloe mentioned also about the issue of ventilation. Uh, that was a major concern among parents early on in the summer. Uh, we have not seen that become an issue at all. Um, all of our applicable buildings that needed to be fortified with glycol uh, have been done. Um, so we're not seeing any impact with regard to uh, ventilation whatsoever. So buildings look good. I will say the reality, Lou, is that as Chloe mentioned, as you get further down the, uh, the graph on addendum four, which is the reopening uh, framework from the state, that reducing person density in school buildings was one of the major factors why I made the decision in conjunction with the CCHD to hold off on broadening our reopening. Um, we know full well with our buildings, they're old, they're out of date, they're out of current design. Uh, and then when we bring more kids in, we certainly reduce the ability to be able to socially distance. So that was a concern certainly from the CCHD. So long answer short, uh, we're looking at both. We're looking at a hybrid calendar for December. We're looking at the potential of a broader reopening, but the data is going to drive that decision. Do we know what that runway for parents would be as far as getting that information? I'm sorry. I understand. I think it's, I think it's great that we're working on, on both plans. I think the parents will be happy to know that we haven't abandoned one for another. Absolutely. But what is your one way for letting parents know as to what plan we're going with? Yeah, Lou, what we'll end up doing is we'll let parents know prior to the uh, Thanksgiving vacation. So for planning purposes, um, and I'm, I'm glad you actually mentioned the time frame too, because it gives me the opportunity just to remind everybody with the travel restrictions, uh, that's going to be one of the things that we also put up on the website and make front and center. We have a lot of families that are going to be traveling for uh, the Thanksgiving vacation, getting together with families. Um, right now, the number of states where it's okay to travel from, it's easier to give you that list than it is the number of states that are currently banned. So it, it begs the question, how many families will travel? How many staff members will travel? What will we have in terms of uh, quarantine on the backside? So we will be prepared for that. Uh, I do know that there are some districts that are considering not opening, going full remote on the backside of Thanksgiving vacation. And at this point in time, that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to maintain hybrid at bare minimum. Thank you, any other questions? Ms. Evans. I just have a quick question, just to piggyback on Lou. Um, I, what's the threshold? Because the, the questions that I'm getting are from my friends is, oh, I, you know, I hope we can make it to Thanksgiving before we go full remote. Because everybody's kind of saying, seeing how high the cases are and everybody's starting to get worried. Is there like a global threshold or does it go by school and, and how you can backfill the teachers and, and all of that stuff? Yeah, that, that's a great question. There are multiple factors that we're going to look at, Kelly. So, you know, certainly staffing is one of the, the factors. In terms of the health metric data, the way the state looks at it is we would not be looking at a full remote experience across the district or multiple schools unless the infection rate got to the point of 25 cases per 100,000 or higher. That's, that's their threshold at this point in time. And again, even with that, I'm going to look at what our local data tells us. Like right now, at this point in time, knock on wood, we don't have any positive cases reported at Hanmer. Um, but again, that certainly is subject to change. Um, I think looking at it from a multimodal component where we look at what are we seeing in terms of our absence rate among students? What is our percentage of families that are learning remote? You know, as we know and our data told us, we don't have a lot of families that are opting out for full remote. So I know I have families that want to come back into the building. So we know that that social distancing piece is going to drop off rather dramatically. I do also want to mention, Kelly, you know, one of the things that I've heard from parents around the full remote Wednesdays. Right now, our hybrid maintains the full remote Wednesday. Um, and our reopening also encompasses that full remote Wednesday. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, my colleagues from the WSPC last week, and one thing I heard loud and clear was the fact that um, parents would like to see a little more of a robust and rigorous experience on those Wednesdays. So our principals are working on that now. So how can we increase the number of synchronous opportunities where it is not just simply a choice board that gives you a, a couple of small choices that don't have a whole lot of academic components to them. So. 
Thank you for that. I like the Wednesdays, um, but that's just me. Maybe because I need a break of trying to figure out how to get everybody on a call at what time. Um, I did just want to make a quick mention um, and put one little positive thing out there is, you know, we're getting the, uh, as parents, we're getting some of the reporting um, from our younger students um, back. And I'm very pleased to announce that my, you know, one of my daughters who kind of was remote for most of kindergarten and now hybrid for most of first grade is progressing really nicely. And she's moved up two reading levels and um, she's increasing her math. And I still think it's amazing how, I swear she stays on track and reminds me when she has a, uh, has a, a call she's got to get on and some of that stuff. And now they're doing She's doing, you know, physical education outside and, you know, my fourth grader is you know, doing really, really well and making kind of great progression with her, with her reading and her math. So as, as tough as this is, I keep telling them it's not forever, but I really do feel like it's not the same, but they really are getting in my opinion, a great education for what we have going on right now. And I'm, I'm really proud of the teachers in the school system and my girls. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Anyone else? Mr. Wade, want... anything to uh, update us from the high school? Um, for the most part, from what I've seen, um, definitely a lot more high schoolers are going uh, are entering quarantine, myself included, but it, it's definitely a precaution that uh, I can find appreciation in trying to limit the exposure. So uh, I, I think everything's going as well as it can be. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I thought I heard someone. Nope, okay, seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. A second? Okay. Second. All in favor say aye. Hi. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Extension. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Stay safe. Yes, everyone stay safe. Thank you. Yes, stay safe.